So it's 2009 and you're Raymond Jacobs, owner of a little game development and publishing firm called Ethereal Darkness Interactive, or EDI. And despite the fact that Ethereal Darkness sounds like the name of an angsty teenage goth band, you managed to put out a couple of games. A Diablo clone entitled Morning Draft, and an isometric point and click called The Lost City of Malathirda. I have no idea if I said that right. But you're more than just another micro-publisher. No, you've gotten into game engine development. You've got your own homebrew engine called Selenite that you're just itching to use to build your next game. But the problem is though, you don't have any ideas. But one day, your wife, and congratulations on getting married by the way, she's found out about a group of nearby ghost hunters called Berkshire Paranormal. Turns out, they know about a haunted mansion. And we ain't talking about no Scooby-Doo shit here. Apparently this is a real haunted mansion. In fact, they're based out of it. So, you know, it sounds like they have absolutely no motivation at all to lie about the mansion being haunted or anything like that. Nevertheless, it gets you thinking. You can make a game about about real life ghost hunting and note the air quotes you can't see. After all, aren't those ghost hunting shows all the rage right now in 2009? So you talk to these Berkshire guys, they sign off on your idea and you get access to the mansion. The problem is you have limited resources and probably a very tiny budget. Building the mansion from the ground up in 3D or 2D is just simply out of the question. It'd be too costly and take too much time. Now you need to make this game quick and as cheap as possible. So you stare adversity right in the face and say, fuck off, I'm a clever booger. That's right. You think of a nice workaround that's going to help you make this game as cheap and as quick as possible. You go out and find a local photographer. You hire them and they're going to take some pictures of the mansion for you. Then you hire some actors or maybe they're just friends of yours. I'm not sure. Hell, you even get the head of the ghost hunters to stand in front of a green screen for you. That's right, ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between. You're making an FMV game in... 2009 because well you tried well hello there ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between i am some guy for those of you that didn't read the title this is they tried a new show that i'm working on that's all about the not so great in pc gaming that's right the focus of this show is shit games. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're like, guy, why the hell are you making a show about shitty games? Well, for starters, it should be fun. And second of all, it's because I really think that you can learn a lot from failure. In fact, I think you learn way more from failure than you can from success. Because you see, a lot of times, success boils down to good timing, luck, and certain external circumstances that are beyond anybody's control. Whereas failure, it always seems a bit more tangible now, doesn't it? Now I know a lot of it's because of Captain Hindsight. But also, there's always a few moments where you can point to something and be like, ah, there it is. That's where you fucked up. And that's what we're doing here at They Tried. I try to find those moments, those design elements, those features in the game that make it shit and try to explain to you why it makes it shit. So for this premiere episode of this show, I have Static Investigative Training, a 2009 FMV point-and-click adventure game originally self-published by EDI. Now, I say originally self-published because for some odd reason, in 2015, Strategy First decided to give this game a Steam release. Why? I got no idea. Maybe Strategy First got creditors to pay. Maybe they got a sweetheart deal from EDI. But it's certainly not because this is a classic FMV game. If you bother to Google the reviews for this game, you'll see there's very few of them. And you'll also see they're not particularly positive. And this is for when it was originally published back in 2009. So I don't think there was really anyone clamoring for this game to be re-released. In fact, I don't think anyone even heard about it until it was published on Steam. But even then, it's still a fairly obscure title. I don't mean it in a condescending way, but we are talking about a micro-published, buy-off-my-website type of game that faded quickly into a obscurity that just now saw a steam release for some odd reason. But even with all that said, there's still a couple of interesting things about EDI and about static investigative training. And for starters, it has to deal with the game engine. See, the game engine's called Selenite, and it's made by EDI. It's their own homebrew engine. Never heard of it? Actually, I'd be fucking shocked if you did. Because you see, outside of EDI games, I could not find any other game that was ever built using this engine. In fact, I'm almost certain that this engine has never seen a public release. But still, there's one little interesting tidbit I found out about the history of this engine that for an adventure game fan like me was kind of fascinating and that's in an old gamedev.net interview that mr raymond jacobs owner of edi gave he stated that dave gilbert yes the dave gilbert of wadget fame was going to be using 
Selenite for an upcoming game. Now this interview was done back in 2010, and it's now 2015, and well, Wadged Eye has never made a game other than Emerald City Confidential that wasn't built using the AGS game engine, and Emerald City Confidential was made using Playground SDK, for those of you that want to know. What's also interesting too is that I could find no follow-up interview or really no other information about this tentative link between Wadged Eye and EDI, so I'm kind of curious what happened there. But I would only be speculating at this point, I've already filled up enough filler for this episode, so let's get on to the game now and take an in-depth look at why static investigator training isn't very good. From the onset, you'll be rather underwhelmed with static investigator training. This is a rather lazy Steam release with no achievements, no cards, no nothing. And I guess Strategy First was ashamed of it because they didn't even bother to include their name in the intro cinematic that we're watching right now. And what the fuck are we watching right now? Looks like someone left the strobe light on again. And it also looks like we're trapped in a 4x3 SD world. Because we are. All the FMV sequences in this game, they're SD. Because HD didn't exist in 2009. Eventually, they spice up the intro with some clippings of newspapers and some lovely shaky cam footage that, well, come on. You should invest it in a tripod and a little bit of better editing. I can see whatever the fuck that is over there. But I will admit, there is one cool thing about this intro. And that's the song. ETI actually shelled out money for a real song from a real band. Yeah, this is a song by Blind Faith and Envy, and it fits the game well enough. Too bad it's the only time we'll hear it in the whole goddamn game. Well, other than for the end credits. Eventually, we reach a point in the intro where we hear an answering machine message play, and it's the answering machine message of our heroine, Julie Masters. Interesting enough, she's still using an answering machine in 2009, like an old school tape sounded one. Here, just listen. Hey, you've reached Julie Masters. I'm not here right now. I'm out walking on the dark side or grabbing a cup of joe. Leave one. Maybe I'll call you back. Sounds like something I would have written in my live journal when I was a teenager. Another thing, too, this game has a weird infatuation with coffee. It's like whoever wrote this was really binging on Twin Peaks at the time. Either way, it turns out that Julie Masters has an interview with these Berkshire paranormal guys, and they also want a trainer, so I guess she already got the job. So we've now reached a point in the game where we're going to get our first look at our hero. And what an impression she makes. Look, I'm not trying to be judgmental or a dick. And maybe it's just me. But what the fuck is this lady wearing? She's wearing like a flannel miniskirt and an ill-fitting tube top while rocking heels. Is this her interview attire? Now don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say this lady's ugly or anything like that. No, 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 no. That's not the point. The point here is that the clothes are ugly. And they do not fit her well at all. She is not pulling off this look. And this is a conscious design choice that the game developers made. They saw this and were like, fuck, nothing looks really weird about this at all these clothes don't look like they poorly fit her or that she really can't pull off this look oh fuck it it's sexy the guys will love to jerk off to this right 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 oh fuck it eventually we get inside the damn mansion where we meet Lindsay, who is the most appropriately dressed character in this whole goddamn game and it also gives us our first taste of how bizarrely written this game is and also how poorly animated here's actually what you see the first time you actually get in the game this is the first dialogue sequence that isn't in an fmv sequence so let's enjoy it together completely unedited one time we had a guy fall asleep during a museum investigation i mean he was out cold ever since then we've made sure that coffee is always brewed up for the crew coffee is my mana Mmm, heavenly nectar of the gods. <laughs> Amen to that. Ladies, you need to try cocaine. It's gonna fucking blow your goddamn mind. And as for that humming in the background, I don't know what the fuck that is. That's in the game. That's not on my end. That's there. They need to clean up their fucking audio. But yeah, that's fucking weird. I mean, the voice acting's fine, but what they're saying, what the fuck are they saying? And this is the first dialogue sequence you hear in the goddamn game. Also, I should point out too that the whole intro cinematic FMV thing and this shit right here, you have to watch it every goddamn time you start up the game because there's no main menu or anything like that. All that shit's hidden away at the top of the screen that you eventually have to migrate your mouse towards. And you can only do that after you've heard and watched the intro. Sure, you can click through it the second time through, but yeah, you still gotta watch a little bit of it. 
I'm not sure if the Selenite game engine can support a main menu or if this is just a conscious design decision. But getting back to the actual game that you're watching. God damn, this shit is terribly animated. It's pretty damn obvious that this thing's dubbed as poorly as a friggin' kung fu movie. Lips aren't synced up at all to what they're saying. Everyone got fucking motor mouths because, well, it kind of looks like they're talking right. After all, it's pretty hard to, you know, sync up lips to dialogue. That would take a lot of effort. But also, you'd have to have those poor actors stand in front of green screen screen talking and you have to dub the audio over and hope it all syncs up pretty well it's a lot of work anyway Lindsay basically exists as an info dump for you she's here to explain the world tell you what you're doing and answer any questions you got and yeah you do have to ask her all the goddamn questions and funny enough it's actually kind of a step down for her because in the demo for this game which i could never find a working copy of she's the protagonist that's kind of an interesting move on edi's part instead of just taking a chunk of the game and releasing that as a demo they instead made a prequel that featured Lindsay as a protagonist and released that for free. But unfortunately, that's not included in the Steam release, and as I mentioned before, I could never find a working copy of the demo out there on the internet. So, who knows what delightful content we missed out on. Nevertheless, Lindsay goes on for a while, and I do mean a while. This is actually a very long dialogue tree we have to work our way through. But eventually, we meet the head, Honcho, the mastermind, the boss of Berkshire Paranormal. He goes by the name of Nick. I can't say his last name. Give her the specifics on what? Hey, kiddo. Glad you could make it. Oh, you know, the basic stuff. Your likes, dislikes, how you like to take long walks on the beach, and puppy dogs, the ages of your grandkids, and your sometimes unhealthy fascination with photography. I don't know what Lindsay's getting at. I assume this dude shoots dick pics. But seriously, what the fuck is this dude wearing? He is rocking dad shorts and the long sleeve shirt. There's only his upper body get cold, but his legs are always the perfect temperature. And he's also chugging coffee too, because, well... I guess that regulates his temperature. But again, this is a conscious design choice. The game developers are like, dude, show us your gams. You don't need pants. No, it doesn't seem kind of weird that you're wearing a long sleeve shirt and shorts. That's completely normal. And yes, I do know people really do rock that shit. I've been to Walmarts. But seriously, for a video game, this is a design choice. Very bad one, I would argue. Because look, this dude can clean up. Look at that. He looked nice in this picture. Dude can dress nice for your video game. And I'm pretty sure that actress would which I could find no information about, I'm pretty sure she cleans up nicely too. But you would think that since you're making an FN read game, that you would want your actors, your actresses, to look kind of nice for it. I know, it sounds like I'm harping on the same point here, but think about it. This is a conscious design decision. You could have had these people dress in something else. It really seems like this is the attire that the people were wearing the first time EDI was testing the green screen, and they're like, oh fuck, we don't have enough money to rent any more of this green screen time. Ah, fuck it, we got enough capture that we can actually do some models, so we'll just roll with that. And speaking of rolling with it, at no point do you actually get to have an interview. It just seems like once Nick shows up, you hired. Yeah, there's no paperwork to sign, no talk about benefits, hours, compensation, nah, nah, nah. Instead, Nick, he's got a PowerPoint presentation for you that explains who these people are that haunt this house that's owned by Masons. The Masonic Order, not a family name Masons, and, well, that's what I thought the first time I played through this game. It's only once I saw the Masonic symbol above the building I realized they were talking about the people who rule the world and all that jazz. Nevertheless, turns out there's a bunch of rich people that used to live here and one day their driver was driving their fancy new car and he lost control some people died now they all sad and they're haunting this house and also this powerpoint presentation too spooky for me too spooky yeah that's actually probably one of the best scares in the whole goddamn game so they set the bar really high from the onset so after the powerpoint ends you finally get a bit of interaction in this game well other than navigating through a dialogue tree nifty so what's the plan the plan is to get you some equipment get you set up with the comm system and take it from there. Cool. So when do I get to play with the toys? Well, let's see what we have in our toy box. Decisions, decisions. I wouldn't touch a goddamn thing that came out of that box, because that shit looks fucking radioactive to me. But seriously, come on, EDI, come on. It is a real noticeable problem throughout this whole goddamn game. Everything has an eerie green screen glow, because they didn't do a great job cropping out the green screen. And it's really fucking noticeable here, come on. 
So anyway, this is kind of an interesting design choice in this game. And in fact, it is probably the best bit of game design you'll see in this whole goddamn game. And that's that you get to pick three or four items out of this little chest of ghost hunting gear. And you get to use that to interact with the world. Now, every little thing in here has a different effect on the world surrounding it. Like, oh, the friggin' handheld camera. It records spooky shit. The little tape recorder. It records spooky sounds. So it's an interesting idea and gives this game some replay value since you can't carry all the toys with you at the same time. And about these toys... Some of them are just bizarre, like this pendant, for instance. Yeah, as I said, a green screen gets kind of rough in this game, as does watching these little transition scenes a game likes to throw in. Yeah, that clearly day for night game. You ain't fooling nobody. But anyway, after that, Nick just leaves. You got your toys, and you get to face your first puzzle in this game. But first, we gotta watch this silky smooth animation of her walking around. It's like she's fucking stuck in molasses or something. It also seems like she has hydraulic legs. Just listen. <laughs> oh my god. There's a gif that could be made of her walking. And it would be fucking hilarious. So about that first puzzle. Yeah, it's not really that great. Basically, for whatever reason, you gotta turn off all the lights. Because ghosts are scared of the light. And it's a trial and error puzzle. You have to keep flicking switches on this breaker box until eventually you get it right. No hints or anything like that. Nope. Pure guesswork, folks. As is a lot of this game. You see, you get little to no direction in this game. In fact, once you turn off the lights, it's not really clear what the fuck you're supposed to be doing. At first, I thought I was supposed to go to every room in this mansion, use my ghost hunting equipment, and then collect evidence. Because, you see, whenever you use one of your bits of ghost hunting kit, it gives you, like, an item. And I was thinking, ah, oh, I see, this is like a little tutorial section. So I'm supposed to probably give all these bits of evidence to Lindsay, and she'll be like, congratulations, you know how to use items in an adventure game. So now we'll tell you what you should be doing. But no, no, that, that's completely wrong. Now, I don't expect any game to hold my goddamn hand, but seriously, give me some fucking direction at least tell me what the fuck i'm supposed to be doing but anyway after wandering around for a while i eventually clicked on a tree stump and it started making noises why yes my friends yes 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 that's simon a shitty, hard to distinguish the difference between each note version of Simon. Oh my god, every adventure game rips off Simon at some point now, doesn't it? Anyway, after following the orders of the supernatural, I was able to beat Simon, and then a ghost popped up. It wasn't very spooky or interesting. She's all ghosty, and our heroine didn't bother to take any videotape, photographs, record any sound, because I guess this is too clear of evidence for a ghost hunter. And doing shit like this, playing Simon on a tree stump, is one of this game's biggest problems. Now, of course, it's an uninspired puzzle design, and of course it's kind of fucking weird that you do this and then it summons some local theater actor. But no, no, no. The real problem here is, in a game about ghost hunters and about ghost hunting, you do no ghost hunting at all. You solve stupid puzzles, like this one right here, where I'm moving books around above a fucking fireplace to open up a secret passage. Why am I doing this? Because I could actually click on the books and I figure there must have been something here. But seriously, this isn't fucking ghost hunting. And the game does a horrendous job of explaining why you're doing any of this. Like, even after solving this puzzle, I have no idea why that was necessary. It was just something I could do, so I did it. And that's just terrible puzzle design. Because a good puzzle, there's an internal logic to it. There's a reason why it exists. For an example, say there's a big-ass wall. Behind the wall is a million trillion dollars. Our hero needs a million trillion dollars to save his farm from an evil corporation. So we know, as a player, that we should try to figure out a way to get over that goddamn wall. But in static investigator training, there's nothing like that. There's no cohesive logic at all. You basically stumble into puzzles, and then you have to bludgeon your way through them. Like again, I have no idea why I'm doing anything in this game other than I have no other options. And maybe you could forgive this if there was some payoff, but there isn't any payoff. You find a diary that just basically regurgitates what you learned in the PowerPoint. Seriously, this diary has nothing cool in it, nothing spooky, nothing really all that interesting. We already know all this shit. There is another diary in the game that I assume holds all the plot, the story, all the interesting ideas this game has, but unfortunately, it's written in an illegible font. What a shame. I'm sure this would have saved the game. But from there, there's really not much else you can do. 
Like, I just wandered around until eventually I went in the graveyard. Now, the first time I went to the graveyard, there was nothing going on. But then I went back after a while, and holy shit, there's a fucking radio there for some reason. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's a timed event. Maybe I clicked on the right thing at some point in the game. It's really hard to tell, because the game gives you no feedback at all. So I clicked on the damn radio, because what the fuck else was I supposed to do? And then started playing, and it was all vague and shit. My god, they keep harping on the same fucking point. I know. I know it sounds like I'm being redundant. But holy shit, that's all this game talks about. Rich people died in a car crash. I got that from the goddamn PowerPoint. They keep going on and on about it. Now, I don't want to sound rude or anything, because this really did happen. These people really did exist, and they really did die in a car crash. But Jesus fucking Christ, that's not a unique or interesting way to die. I could totally believe that people die in car accidents, because guess what? These people weren't the first people to die in a car accident, and they won't be the last. From there, the ghost just keeps rambling on about the same shit we already know about. And then eventually, another ghost pops up. Yeah. Yeah, that's the ghost of the father whose kids died in the car crash, and he died of like a broken heart or something. All very sad. And yeah, all this is based on a true story. It has a Wikipedia page and everything, but again, not exactly inspiring the way it's told here. So, we get a watch as Ghost Dad just walks over to his grave and disappears. Why does he do that? I don't know. Maybe in original draft, you were supposed to look for this grave for some reason, but not in the version you actually play. Because you already know that the dude's buried here, because his name's on the fucking tombstone. So why is it so surprising that he walks to his grave? Yes, it's spooky. But yeah, speaking of half-assed shit, there's a shovel I picked up. Now, you can use this shovel on a piece of dirt over where the first ghost lady showed up, and you'll find a box in it. And inside the box, you'll find a piece of jewelry. Turns out, it belonged to one of the ladies who's a ghost now. Now, me, thinking like, this is an adventure game i thought i would take this necklace and put it back in her jewelry box because i already discovered that because i clicked on every fucking thing in this game but once i got over there nope no luck at all turns out jewelry does not work inside a jewelry box there's no point behind it actually there's no point behind either one of these items it just seems like there was an idea for a puzzle here that just wasn't implemented which kind of gets me back to one of the points i made earlier saying that i don't think this game was finished but either way we've reached the climax now of the game yeah, seriously, this is pretty much the last few minutes of it right now. What was that? I'm sorry, I must have missed We have one more puzzle to solve, and then it pretty much game over from here. And what a pathetic finale for a puzzle it is. Seriously, I had to do nothing there. You think, oh, you got it in the first go. No, no, no. You click it, it solves itself. There's no messing with the reflection of light or anything like that. Jesus, it's like this game isn't even trying at this point. We had a flashlight the whole fucking game, but for whatever reason, the flashlight, it doesn't have the right illuminescence to expose this radioactive watch. And seriously, game, god damn it, crop better. If I was a teacher and this was a student project, I'd look at this shit and I'd be like, Timmy, Timmy, for the love of God, I get it. Okay, here's a green screen here, but Jesus, use that magic wand tool better. Or better yet, have it on a different background other than green, so it's not so goddamn obvious. I'll tell you fucking what, just have a black fucking mat and take the pictures on it. I know it would be a bit more work for you to have to crop it out right, but Jesus fucking Christ, this isn't rocket science. <sighs> So either way, I wandered around for a bit longer, and eventually I was back outside, and then we saw some light up in the attic, which I guess is supposed to be exciting, but I've already been up to the attic and nothing happened other than there being a shitty diary in there, but for whatever reason, oh god, we're gonna walk up to the attic, and there's a ghost there, and he just walks through us. Turns out that was a driver who committed suicide after he accidentally killed those ladies. That's very sad. And then Lindsay's like, you know, sometimes you can't help all the ghosts, and our hero's like, yeah, I get it. Hey kiddo, how'd it go? You're the teacher. You saw the show. What do you say? Hmm. Well, I'd say we're looking at the newest investigator trainee. Yeah, you did great. It'll be nice to have another girl on the team. Yay! I guess you accomplished something. I guess. You revealed information they already knew. The driver committed suicide a couple days after he accidentally killed the girls. That's documented history. You didn't really uncover anything. Actually, what the fuck were you supposed to be doing? And pretty damn obvious, this place is super haunted. But fuck off. I know. Why is she even here? Why'd you do anything? Oh, what the fuck was the point behind this game? Maybe in this wee hours, this final moments of the game, it will explain itself. And maybe it'll all be worth while.
I went to North Adams in the hopes of disproving the existence of ghosts. I went to see if the static nature of things to stay put was in fact false, that energy would not stay, but disperse in the afterlife. I expected to find a creaky old house with a story that did no more than spark the human imagination, but what I found was a sad secret story with enough power to linger after death. What I left with was an intimate knowledge of a secret past, and an infallible belief in an existence beyond the grave, not to mention several new friends with whom I can explore this frightening new landscape. What more could a girl ask for? A better game. But in all honesty, I don't know what secret history she's going on about. I guess there's kind of some hints that the driver and one of the ladies that died were in love because their pictures are in the locket. And that's why they're still ghosts and that's why they're still hanging out because he's super sad that he killed the woman he loved. All right, I guess I can buy that, but I really can't buy anything else in this game. Holy shit. To try to figure out where this game went wrong, it starts at the very beginning. It is super hard to take this game seriously. It's not that it's an FMV game. I like it. FMV games. I adore their campy nature, but this one, it just starts off incompetently, stumbles around, never bothering to explain itself. It's a ghost hunting game that features no ghost hunting and very lazy puzzles. It's not that this game is complete and utter shit or terrible, it's just that it's boring. It's uninspired. There's nothing really exciting about it. Sure, the part where you get to select the different tools to go explore the house with, it's pretty cool, but it has no impact on the overall game. It's just filler. To be honest with you, when I think back on this game, I really think that things went wrong with this game because it just wasn't completed. Seriously, there's items in this game that you can't do anything with. There's no plot to speak of. It doesn't feel like anything here is fleshed out. This feels very much so like a rough draft, like a part one, like an introduction to a bigger game that just never was made. And that's a fundamental problem here. There's no substance. There's nothing to keep you intrigued. There's nothing to engage you with this game. The puzzles feel like placeholders. The characters are horribly underdeveloped. And even the way it ends, it feels like it's setting up for a bigger game. Static Investigator Train just really feels like a tutorial section for a game that was released as a full game for whatever reason. Likely financial ones. It wastes its premise. It wastes its setting. This is a real haunted house. It could have done so much with it. It featured a real ghost hunter. It could have done so much with that, but just did nothing. It just flopped around like a fish on a pier. Kind of like the end of this video is right now. <laughs> Alright, so that does it for They Tried. I've been some guy and as I said before, this is They Tried. A look into the not-so-great NPC gaming. And for my next episode, I'm going to be taking a look at a not-so-obscure Polish game. Or maybe it is obscure. I don't know. Either way, it's Enemy Front. It came out not that long ago and I'm going to be taking a look at it here on They Tried. So ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between, have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.